Hi, everyone. We're so excited to be here tonight for our sixth community table conversation. We have been learning together all year long with these amazing discussions, and tonight we've got a great one on tap. We're taking a closer look at diabetes in the LGBTQ plus community. I'm going to hand it off in just a moment to an incredible panel, um, but first, want to thank those who make Community Table conversations possible. Community Table is presented by the JDRF Beyond Type 1 Alliance and made possible with support from Abbott Diabetes Care, Dexcom, Lilly Diabetes, Mankind, Medtronic, Omnipod, Roche Diabetes Care, and Tandem. If you have questions for tonight's panelists, be sure to drop them into the chat if you're joining us on Zoom or into the comments if you're watching on Facebook. And we're gonna do our best to get to them a little bit later in the conversation. For now, I'm gonna ask all of our amazing, amazing panelists to go ahead and come on video. And I'm gonna hand it off to Alexi, who's gonna be moderating tonight's conversation. Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, hey, everyone. Welcome to the community table. We're here on behalf of Beyond Type 1, and tonight we will be taking a closer look at diabetes in the LGBTQ plus community, and we're looking forward to getting started. So today's discussion will be about the lived experiences of each of these incredible individuals, and we do ask for your respect as they share their stories. Um, and as Jordan said, feel free to leave questions in the comments, and we'll do our best to get to them toward the end. We're going to be linking some resources as well in the chat for anyone who might be interested in learning more. So let's get started by meeting our phenomenal panelists. I'm Alexi. I'm your moderator tonight. Uh, I'm a staff writer here at Beyond Type 1. I've had type 1 diabetes for 17 years now, and I am a part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, I've been active in both communities for quite some time now as a writer and an advocate, um, in addition to being a journalist, I also write creatively and um, an actor and an artist. Um, super glad to be with you all tonight. And now let's hear from our panelists. Um, Kyle, let's start with you. Hi, um, I'm Kyle Banks. Uh, I'm an actor, a vocalist, and founder of Kyla Cares, which is a nonprofit foundation that provides uh, grants for insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors for kids and young adults living with type 1 diabetes. Um, I have been a type 1 diabetic since November of 2015 and uh, like Alexi I'm also like very involved in both communities as well. I'm also a part of the 10th magazine which is a, a publication that highlights the history, ideas, and aesthetics of the Black gay community. Um, so yeah, we do, um, thanks to Kyla Cares and the 10th, I'm, I'm very involved in both. And uh, how about you, JP? I'm JP Qualters. Um, I'm also an actor as well. Um, I've had type 1 diabetes for 21 years. I was diagnosed when I was 10. Um, I also am a part of the LGBTQ community and um, like to support both. So I'm happy to be here. How about Ray? Let's go to you. Hey guys, uh, I've been uh, diabetic for 21 years now, um, just like JP. So that's pretty cool. Um, born and raised in Southern California, uh, super active in both communities. I'm looking forward to finally discussing how both communities kind of have similarities. And Simone, you're up next. Hi everyone. I've been a type 1 diabetic since 93, so uh, 28 years this October. I'm an artist. I do a lot of other things to survive. And oh yes, I'm queer and I'm bi binary and trans. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Kitty Wine. So I'm an adult endocrinologist at The Ohio State University. We always have to say it that way. And I won't tell you how long I've been in endocrine, but I've been directly involved in type 1 diabetes for over about 15 years now. And really what happened is one of my colleagues came to me one day and said, we need to dedicate some clinic time specifically to type 1 diabetes. Um, they're just mixed in with all the type twos and, and they, you know, we need to make some dedicated time. And that doesn't usually happen in adult endocrine clinics. And it's really just grown from one half day a week to where I am now is a full-time program where we really have about two and a half doctors specifically focused on type one diabetes and a lot more resources. 
and and why I like to come here is is I learn so much from you guys. Everything I'm going to hear tonight, I'm going to incorporate in what I do and working with my patients. So thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for everything that you do. And thanks for all those amazing introductions. Uh, I'm excited to learn more about each and every one of you. Um, so just to kind of kick it off, um, we'd love to hear your individual stories around diabetes. Um, when were you diagnosed? I know you kind of touched on it a little bit, but uh, diagnosis, um, what has your journey been like and what technology or type of treatment and management do you use? I guess I'll go first. Uh, uh, I'm, oh, sounds like I'm also the baby of the bunch, which is cool. Um, again, I was diagnosed in 2015, so it's almost been six years for me. Um, I was on tour with um, the Lion King uh, in California at the time of my diagnosis. I just began feeling really ill, and like a matter of like two, three weeks, I lost like 30 pounds, which uh, sort of scared the hell out of me. And um, was the, the thing that made me seek care. So I went to an urgent care facility that was across the street from the theater where the show was uh, playing. Um, and that's when I was told that he did a, a glucose test and he told me that he suspected I had type two diabetes because only because I was, um, at the time I was on steroids for some vocal issues that I was having. And I was on a prolonged regimen of steroids. So he thought that maybe um, Maybe that had induced a, a diabetic episode. Um, so three more weeks went on. I wasn't getting any better. I was prescribed metformin at the time. And I just continued to lose weight, continued to feel like really ill and had no energy, which was like really important, especially like for the show that I was a part of. Um, and I, as the show was wrapping up in California, we were moving on to Denver. I decided to go to come to New Orleans. Uh, which is where I'm from, and just to see my physician. And that's when I was hospitalized and uh, di properly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. All right, who's up next? Um, I will go, sure. Um, I got type 1 diabetes when I was 10 years old. I was um, very physically active at that time, and um, my teachers kept asking my parents if I had like an eating problem because I was so natu nat was naturally thin. Um, so my parents took me to the doctors and they tested my blood sugar and it was um, extremely high um, to a point where I, they rushed me to the hospital and um, spent a good six days there learning all about diabetes and was also diagnosed with celiac disease um, this, on the same day that I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. Um, which they both coincide, um, multiple people have with type 1 diabetes, also have celiac disease. They might not know it yet, but they do. Um, yeah, and I am on a Dexcom G6. Um, I think it's a game changer for performers. Um, I'm not on a pump um, and I use pens daily. Nice. Um, Kyle, did you want to talk about what uh, any tools you were using or? Oh, yes. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I also have celiac uh, JP. Um, but hey. yeah, <laughs> in the house. Um, also <laughs> use uh, Dexcom G6 and Omnipod insulin pump. And I cannot agree more. It has definitely been a game changer for me, especially with like performing and going into work. It just allows me to do so safely and I'm able to maintain like within a certain range. And it's been really, it's been, it's been cool incorporating it into management. Wonderful. How about uh, Ray? So I have vivid memory. I was diagnosed at eight. Um, it's, it's crazy to think back. Like, I wish I could remember more, but for some reason, I just like can't remember everything. I just remember going to the hospital and being diagnosed. Um, I'm, my family wasn't too familiar at the time. So um, it's been, it, I just remember kind of, uh, kind of bad memories at that, at that time when I was first diagnosed. Um, just like uh, JP, or I started on pens for a little bit, 
for a long time actually. And then I finally switched to a pump. Uh, I'm on the T-Slim now and G6. So it's helping me to stay, mat stay in control. Fantastic. And how about you, Simone? Um, like JP, I got it when I was 10, like literally like two weeks after my 10th birthday. Um, I remember, um, I mean, I was pretty young, but I remember like peeing a lot and being thirsty and being young and not really liking water. I drank lots of juice, which kind of sped things up, I'm sure. I, my grandmother uh, was type two diabetic. Um, so I kind of knew about it, which I mean, out of the things I could have gotten, at least I had some reference. Um, and yeah, I was peeing a lot and my teacher kind of was just like pushing my mom to take me to the doctor. Um, and then eventually one day my mom took me and I had like 600 plus blood sugar um i was afraid of needles so uh at that time that was the only option like literal injections so that was a lot to come over and they were very uh, uh not sensitive um but i either way i learned how to do all those things um adolescence lots of dk's for at least the first 12 years and then lots of hypoglycemic issues um, since. And yeah, now I'm on the uh, G6 and the, the Tandem T-Slim. Um, pumps are amazing. Um, I haven't had, for lack of like colonizing. Looks like Simone froze a little bit. Is that just me? Yeah, he froze. Okay. Um, oh, there you are. You're back. Sorry. Problem? Yeah, I don't know what I was saying. Pardon me. Yeah, no worries. Um, great to hear from all of you on that. Um, so when it comes to identifying ourselves, right? Um, where does diabetes sort of rank on your list of identifiers? So, you know, that could include LGBTQ+, whatever, however you're kind of presenting yourself to other people and to the world, like where does diabetes rank? Saying, hey, I have type one or wherever that sort of comes into play. And also um, <laughs> sometimes, including me, some people in the LGBTQ plus community um, that also live with diabetes joke that it's kind of like we have to come out twice, you know what I mean? So like we have two coming out parties, like, do you feel like there's much truth to that in your journey as well? Um, well, for me personally, I think uh, diabetes ranks pretty high on the list. Um, it's all part of like the discovery process, discovering who Kyle Banks is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I wear my, insulin pump usually on my arm. So because of the hardware, uh, it usually sparks a lot of conversation um, uh, centered around like diabetes and what's this patch you're wearing and you know, how's it, how's it helping you? Um, which is really great because um, I, I didn't realize that, you know, doing that was like a form of advocacy, but it is, especially working with um, the kids that I'm involved with, because a lot of them are apprehensive about wearing uh, the technology that's available on their body. So um, yeah, I, I, I initially started wearing it on my arm because it just, it was a great place for my, it was a great wardrobe at the show that I was performing in, created like bands for my arms. So it just seemed, I just continued wearing it there um, and it's just comfortable there for me. Um, but uh, I, because I, like I said at the top, you know, because I work in like queer spaces and also I'm like really involved in this diabetic space, I, I, I kind of, I really, they're both like high at the, on the list for me as far as like how I identify. Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting how our, uh, our tools and our technology kind of come out for us in a way. Yeah, <laughs> so most definitely, here. yes. Nice. 
All right, who else wants to weigh in? Yeah, I agree with Kyle. Um, for me, I think because I, got, I was diagnosed so young, um, diabetes was like number one for me. And then as I grew into more um, myself and learning who I was and knowing that I wanted to pursue a theater career, I think I became more comfortable with um, becoming gay and being gay. And that just kind of happened naturally, but I definitely tied two and two together. Like um, for me, at least, uh, um, being a gay diabetic is definitely like what I promote and um, want other gay diabetics to feel comfortable talking about it and using and showing their devices when they go out and not having an issue with it. Um, but doing perform performing is, is hard. I, I, I had to put my Dexcom in some strange places for <laughs> some shows that I've done. So yeah, um, yeah, depends on the show. Kinky Boots was rough to say the least, but um, I made it work. Um, yeah. Love that, would love to hear more about that sometime. Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who else? So I'll go next. Um, introducing as a type one diabetic for me, growing up, um, probably even till now, I hide it as long as I could until I actually get to know people more because I hate questions. Um, and especially uh, the people that I, that I work around with, the people in my family, they're so, uh, I guess uneducated and that's partially my fault. I should probably talk to them more about it, but it's it's not ranked the highest. Um, I definitely do think it's, for me at least, people like me who uh, don't, I guess, show it off right away, it, it, it could be like coming out twice. Um, and especially because I, I, I think I shared this with maybe one or two, but in government. So I, you know, just like Kyle and, J, and JP, they are around a lot of, I guess, uh, queer people and people like myself, because I work in government, the courthouses is very strict, very uniformed. And, you know, coming out gay to them was even like a big shock. And, and then yet alone, they're looking at me like, why do you have things, you know, paging during, during court hearings? Or why is your phone going off? And it, it's just a big explanation that I try to avoid at first until I get to know someone then you know I'm, I'm an open book okay yeah absolutely Simone um yeah I'm gonna tag team off of Ray uh same especially with actually my diabetes I feel like it's new for me to be as open about it as I am or even putting I mean about also bios are a new thing you know um, but like putting in my bio, right? Like, I feel like I didn't tell anyone until I had to. Um, and I think perhaps I always pull things out at a certain time just so that folks can see to like start that conversation that who knows what will happen to me tonight. But like, you know, like, but also, yeah, generally folks didn't find out till or to like what that degree means. Like I have to educate folks. so. Like, do I have the energy? Will I even see this person again? Uh, kind of dictates like, you know, how much I say about me in general, I think. Um, but definitely my diabetes, I felt like. Um, I, I think I just started wearing a like an alert brace, like necklace a couple years ago. But most of my life, most folks didn't really know or they didn't know what it meant for me or like, things like that. So not to say that it didn't rank well, I appreciate now where I'm at, where I'm able to talk about it and engage with it in the way I am. Um, but I, I think I preserve my energy for what I share about myself with folks uh, all around, just because there's like a multitude of layers you gotta dig through to like explain things to folks and like who will be open to it and like who will take it in and be scared or like, kind of, I'm also an empathist. So like thinking about how people will feel about all of my identities along with me, feeling their reactions and et cetera. Absolutely, yeah, definitely makes sense. 
Um, as a follow-up to that, um, has there, you know, if anybody feels comfortable sharing a time when you were particularly afraid to share openly um, about who you are in the LGBTQ plus community or um, having diabetes or both? Um, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, you know, I have a crazy story. I was um, uh, this right before the pandemic, uh, the holiday season right before the pandemic, I was invited to Christmas party for um, a really amazing organization called Children with Diabetes. Um, and I was going with my partner. We've been together for 18 years now. Um, and so we, we were driving there. So on our way to the party was in Ohio at the um, founder of uh, Children with Diabetes, Jeff Hitchcock, Hitchcock's home. Um, so my partner and I were talking on the way there as we were getting closer to arriving at his house, like, oh my God, we're in the middle of Ohio, two black men. Like, do we need to go back in the closet right now? Like, what are we about to walk into? Like, it was just a lot. And so I just, I mean, that was the last time I really felt nervous about presenting like my, my entire self. And that usually does not happen. I'm pretty like, um, I'm pretty like, confident and comfortable with who I am and bringing that to the table. Uh, but for some reason, in this particular moment, I was just like really nervous and considering uh, how do I handle like this man that I've been with for 18 years and these strangers that I'm about to meet, I just had no idea. But we walked in and everybody was loving and embracing and it's been the most amazing part of my life since that initial meeting. But um, yeah, just sometimes, you know, those those feelings, they come back up to the surface. Um, and, you know, where are they from? I mean, we just live in a country, in a world that can be like very like homophobic and racist and like just all the isms that just, you know, make the world a, 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 a not so sweet place sometimes. But needless to say, that didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You kind of get into a routine of your life and comfortable with, you know, how people are going to respond to things based on where you are or what you're doing. And then you get into a situation and you're like, am I going to have to go back in the closet? <laughs> like, that's not a great feeling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, great. Anybody else? Yeah, I can share. Um, again, because of <laughs> what my career is, uh, I'm like on the daily, there's at least one person I come across that I kind of have to go back in the closet just because I'm scared that of their opinion. I see how um, a lot of like law enforcement are. I see how a lot of um, judges are. It's just uh, a feeling that I, I'm scared sometimes, I would say at least once a day coming across, depending on who I'm working with that day um, also, I have a crazy story. I am also sometimes scared to come out as a type one diabetic. Um, for the longest time I was dating this person, um, this is going back before my partner now, but I was dating someone and we were, I would say maybe on the fourth or fifth date. And I told him, uh, you know, I'm type one diabetic. And I remember getting a response, like basically saying I'm too much work and too much baggage. So ever since that conversation I had with that particular person, moving forward, every single person I dated, I was scared to admit, like I have this disease, you know, it requires, it requires a lot of work that I have to do on a daily, it depends where we go, what, what we do, it impacts everything that we do and the person or the people that I'm with. Um, so I guess I've experienced both where I'm scared to come out gay and I'm, I'm scared to tell someone that I have a disease and it's for the rest of my life. Absolutely, both can be very intimidating to tell somebody because you feel like you're sort of like putting that on them and it's, yeah, absolutely valid. To, to go off from there, uh, it, it's fascinating to me um, just because I think I'm kind of comfortable with both, um, that like uh, gay men with diabetes feel like they have to hide things from other gay men because of like the stigma that they have or that they think that we have too much baggage or that we don't 
we have too many problems or we have like an illness that is never going to go away. I, I'm very upfront about it when I meet people, but I also tell them that like my brain is constantly thinking about myself and my health. And sometimes I don't want to make the decision on where we go to dinner. And, and sometimes I, I don't want to decide on like what I'm going to cook tonight because my brain is thinking about 1800 other things. You know what I mean? It's fascinating right. to me. Fascinating. Sure. Anybody else want to add to that? No? All right. Um, so we all know there's a lot of misconceptions and stigma around both diabetes and being LGBTQ plus. Um, what's one thing that you would want people to know about living with diabetes within the LGBTQ Q plus community and how can others help combat the stigmas and misconceptions and better support their friends and loved ones? Um, I'll, I would say that um, I, I'm a, very, a big advocate on speaking your truth and, and, and saying your feelings. I have a hard time not showing my feelings. So um, uh, be proud of who you are and, and, and the traumas that you've had to make, make that who you are. I grew up, I had to grow up very quickly with having type one diabetes as, as a 10 year old, injecting myself with insulin, getting sent on field trips by myself, getting sent on track, whatever, or going to do a show by myself. Like I just had to grow up very quickly. So I think that that is part of the reason why, who I am today, but uh, speak your truth and, and know that having diabetes is just part of your journey and it's making you a stronger, better human being in the end. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah, I would definitely piggyback off what JP said, you know, speaking your truth is just really, it's so important. I mean, I get like the fear and the trepidation that comes up with like sharing these types of things. Um, just because like people, uh, you know, we, especially as, in, as those that identify as gay men, you know, it, it, it can be a bit, a little toxic sometimes, especially, as, you know, we've seen the way people with living with HIV are treated and the terms that are used to, to describe that disease, especially on like the, the apps like Grindr and Jack and, you know, the use of words like clean and dirty. So, you know, why, would, why wouldn't those fears transfer over to like this diabetes space? So I just think we have to do a, a better job at just pushing against that toxic way of being within the culture just in general. Absolutely. It's an interesting point about the apps. <laughs> All right, anyone else? Um, yeah, I also say make space for yourself. And like, I feel like just, yeah, over evolution, like figuring out what I needed to be, <laughs> like who I needed to be around, the type of space I needed at different times. Um, was helpful for me to be able to explain that to folks. Um, so like, it, it's a, and yeah, it's almost like tag teaming off what both Kyle and JP said, like, um, get with, like you should, you shouldn't, I mean, and that's hard to name because you can't always name the space you're in. But like, I feel like for folks who I feel I invest in with spending space when I have the decision to make that, right, or the space to make that decision um, that I cannot be in spaces where I have to compartmentalize myself or shove parts of me in places <laughs> like I, I don't have the energy for it anymore. Um, I've done it for a long time and like folks will survive as they need, um, but I'm also trying to like spend as much of my time being complete um, and yeah, being able to be my complete self, with all the layers and be accepted and also have folks who are down to learn who I am and not assume and like know that things change and just like, yeah, so 
find the spaces where you can be all of you so that you don't have to like feel that you need to hide or shove or like put parts of you anywhere for anyone else's benefit or, or maybe not. Awesome, thank you, That's amazing advice. Ray, did you wanna add anything or? I was thinking, but I agree with everyone. I think just speaking your truth is, is probably the most important thing. Uh, don't be afraid, you know, to basically speak about who you are. There's gonna be people who love you regardless. So um, I think if anyone's listening to me, they can tell that I had a lot, lot of hesitant um, when speaking about both things. So if if I'm if anyone is listening to me, just just speak your truth and don't be afraid. That's something I wish I had learned many years ago and not close to 30. Absolutely. I think we can all probably relate to that. Mm -hmm. So fantastic. This next question is for Kitty. Um, so you're an endocrinologist at Ohio State. Um, interested how you foster a safe environment for your patients. Um, can you talk a little bit about ensuring that your students are comfortable being open with you? So I think I would say that just my approach to diabetes and working with my young adults and my older adults is something where I'm trying to create a safe environment to begin with. Um, what I've learned is a lot of people coming out of pediatric feel that every visit was difficult, um, traumatic, they were judged, they were yelled at, they were wrong, and, and I don't want them to feel that way. I want them to feel safe coming to clinic to begin with. I, I, I don't want people to think, oh, my A1C is going to be horrible, I can't go to clinic because she'll yell at me. And even if I tell you I'm going to yell at you, I promise you I'm never going to. I, I, I can't even do that myself. But, but I want people to feel that they can come safely, they can make mistakes, they can admit to mistakes, and then we make a plan to go forward. So, so that's kind of where I start with is trying to create a positive environment. And then that extends beyond just the sugar. And um, just for example, in terms of who comes to clinic with you, as a student, if your mom wants to come to the first visit, that's okay but mom waits in the waiting room after the first visit because this is your visit. This is about you, this isn't about your mom. But on the, the opposite side, if your partner wants to come, I encourage your partner to come because I want your partner to be involved and your partner needs to learn. And, and I wanna have an opportunity to teach and I want my dietitian educators to get to teach a partner. So again, it's, it's making it a safe place where you feel like you're not being judged, where, you know, how can we constantly move forward? And then I feel it's my job to bring up tough issues. Um, we ask people about plans for pregnancy when they're 18 years old, and they're kind of horrified that someone's asking. We ask about sexual dysfunction. We bring up the subject of alcohol. Um, I try to proactively bring it up so that you know that you can talk to me about things like that. And, and what can I do to help you? Um, what can I do to help you make your diabetes work with you? And, and that's a challenge for a lot of people. So, so I think that that's a lot of what I do to try to make them feel safe overall, just starting with the idea of it's okay to come in and admit you made a mistake. It's okay to come in and talk about problems with the world. And a lot of our diabetes visits we don't really even talk about sugar and we don't turn into insulin dosing. We talk about how do you make life and diabetes work together. Amazing, thank you for creating that safe space. That's amazingly important. Um, let's, let's touch on that. Let's talk a little bit more about why it's so crucial to have a healthcare provider that we feel like we can trust. And have any, any of you ever felt uncomfortable with a healthcare provider or um, one that made you feel like you couldn't share openly? Can I tell you guys a story while you guys are thinking about it? So Please. one of the things that brought this up to me is when I was in my training, I was an endocrine fellow 
And um, because of who one of our senior faculty was, we had a lot of transgender patients. And somehow I got a lot of these patients and I was gone on vacation one time. And when I came back, one of my patients came to clinic, but was very upset because apparently the person who covered for me would not even walk through the doorway into the room. That person was so scared of this patient that the, the doctor in training stood in the doorway and talked to the patient, wouldn't come in, wouldn't touch them. And to me, that just broke my heart. I mean, this person is a human being, how can you do that? And, and that just horrified me and, and made me think about how do I work with patients and how do I work with people who are supposedly different because they're not different, they're normal human beings. Um, I can't change that doctor, but I can change what happens to my patients. Absolutely. That just touches on the importance of um, why we need people we can trust. Um, did anybody want to weigh in on why we feel it's so crucial or, or if you had any of those experiences that were not so great? Um, I wouldn't say that I've had bad experiences, but um, as an actor, uh, uh, being part of a union, you um, get a certain amount of weeks of health insurance. And then if you leave a show or you show ends, you could potentially lose your health insurance. So um, living as an actor with like unknown, do I have good health insurance or do I go on Medicare? Do I have health insurance? Do I go on Medicare? It's, Mm -hmm. definitely been a wild ride to say the least um I, I I'm I have been lucky to not have had a, a bad doctor but um have had multiple doctors to say as well due to lots of different health insurances um but yeah okay um does anybody else want to weigh in otherwise I'll go ahead and move on no, I'll say I've mostly had bad experiences with medical professionals and doctors. Um, uh, I can name the few. But I feel like a lot don't listen, or a lot have said that my experiences don't aren't valid because they've never heard of them. Um, I, I I feel like till recently, until I've started finding community um, with other diabetics. Um, that I haven't really met folks who have had my experience. Um, a lot of chastising and like blaming, especially in adulthood about like what I know and what I don't know and about changing um, of like information and like <laughs> being blamed about things. Um, it's hard to find someone who will listen and also like work with me. Like I often feel like I'm being told but not like listened to it doesn't feel quite uh, a reciprocal relationship which I feel is valid and important yet it's really hard to find. And similar to I mean I, I personally have not had um, negative experiences I'm like really lucky in that regard. But I have heard like many horror stories similar to what Simone has shared. And the number of times that I hear people feel as if they're not being listened to, or um, I often refer like people to my doctors um, because they are like so great and they have like just amazing bedside manner or in office manners, I should say. Um, and and a lot of times, a lot of the feedback I get from them is like, wow, it's the first time I actually had a conversation with the doctor about like my life, even outside of diabetes. So um, it's unfortunate to hear that so many people of color and trans people or people who identify as trans are, are having these awful experiences in the clinician's office. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm glad to hear that you sort of help others, you know, find the right, uh, you know, the right people that they can trust. And that's super important. Um, so we know that approximately three in five people with diabetes report, um, issues with mental health and emotional health and people in the LGBTQ plus community, um, are at least 
2.5 times more likely to experience depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. Um, can we talk a little bit about why it's so important to recognize um, that this intersection can create a high risk population and um, why is making sure that we have this adequate support um, from others just so crucial? I can, I can start this one. Um, I, I heard you mentioned uh, substance abuse. Um, unfortunately, my coming out gay, uh, coming out as gay to my family was one of the worst experience ever. <laughs> and I, to this day, still don't talk to about maybe 80% of my family just because they don't accept me um, for being, uh, coming out as gay. So at that time, I remember really relying on a lot of different substance to get by. I basically started like just raging, partying like crazy. Um, I got into a lot of drugs and alcohol and we, and then at the time I also forgot I was type one diabetic, right? On top of coming out as gay, family not accepting me, uh, drinking, doing drugs. You know, I live 20 minutes from West Hollywood, West Hollywood, I was going like Sunday through Sunday. Like I was just at a bad place. And I think it's really important to have the support to have the resources to get someone out of that cycle because I look back I mean thankfully now I got my life together and I went to school and all that you know all that good stuff but I look back and I think about how hard it was coming out as gay and dealing with substance abuse and trying to manage a disease that takes over you know your whole life basically so you know um just finding the resources and uh, not giving up. I unfortunately have a lot of friends that part of the LGBT, uh, you know, community that took their own lives because of similar reasons that they didn't have the support from people they love. So um, I think just remembering that things get better. Yeah, I, I think uh, support is so important. And um, like, like Ray said, you know, when you don't, when, when you're not there fully mentally and you're struggling, it, it makes it hard to really care for yourself. And one thing that type one diabetes requires is that you are constantly paying attention to like management of this disease, even when you're sleeping. So um, if, if you're not feeling like completely there mentally, or if you're really struggling, it just makes, it just compounds just an awful situation and the outcomes usually end horribly. So it, 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 paying attention to our mental health and trying to stay positive and finding a like community of people that support you, a system of support is just, is crucial to, I think, successful management of this disease. All right, thank you for sharing that. Does anybody have any um, experiences with burnout uh, that you can recall or any related mental health struggles that uh, in any, any particular time in your life that you wanna talk about? I haven't ex experienced burnout, but I just remember like a year, at, uh, up to like a year after my diagnosis, I was just like really depressed. And it was just, it was just so overwhelmed with like trying to learn everything about how to properly take care of myself. And I'm doing this show at the same time. So my glucose is crashing every night and I'm, like plummeting into like the, sometimes into like the twenties and it was just an awful time for me, but when I was able to take a little time off from work to really learn, you know, what taking care of myself meant and the best care practices is mm -hmm. when things really began to turn around for me. And uh, I, I was able to have a better outlook on like what I was dealing with. But yeah, it's, it's interesting how sort of burnout and or denial can kind of strike at different times with everybody. So it's, mm -hmm. You know, it's ultimately probably hits everybody at some point, but it's yeah. uh, never easy. 
Um, does anybody else have any? I would say I, I had a similar, I've had a burnout via performing eight shows a week and trying to manage my blood sugars. Uh, at some point in time, when I was in Kinky Boots, I weighed about 15 pounds less than I do right now. And I just was crashing every night after the show, like three or four hours after the show. And it would obviously wake me up. So I wouldn't get enough sleep and then would have to be back at the show the next morning, like putting on my makeup and hoping that everything was going to go smoothly. But yeah, so eventually I, I had to like take two weeks off and be like, let me, let me like figure this out or things can go poorly. Um, but um, yeah, grateful that it happened. And now I'm a stronger, better diabetic and human for it. So yeah. Love that. Right. Um, so for Kitty, I'm curious, how do you approach these kinds of conversations around burnout and mental health with your patients? And do you have any specific tools or resources that you recommend when they're, when they're struggling with this? So y'all will probably laugh at me, but I would say I still struggle to figure out how to talk about these issues. I know how important burnout is. I know how depression affects your diabetes, but how do you open the topic of conversation with someone? How do you get them to talk about it? I will tell you one of the more interesting ones to me is I can't tell you how many times I've tried to talk to someone who's had type 1 diabetes for 30, 35 years about their issues with denial and how denial is a barrier to taking care of their diabetes. And of course, everybody always says, no, no, I don't deny my diabetes. I accept it. And I'm like, no, but you are in denial and try to work them through the things that show that they're still trying to pretend they don't have diabetes. So that's probably the easiest one to identify and talk about, but very hard to work through. Um, burnout is a huge struggle. I, a lot of times I get frustrated with myself because after a visit, I'll be like, oh, I should have talked to him about that. Oh, that's what the real problem is. And so I might send the person a message or call them and just say, hey, you know, we need to talk about this. What can we do to help you? What I tend to do to try to make sure we talk about some of these issues is I often start a visit with, you know, how are you doing? For the last year, it's been, how are you coping with COVID? You know, are you getting through this pandemic? Do you want to talk about it? Um, what's going on in your life? Do you have any specific issues you want to talk about? So I try to open it up with let's talk about life rather than jumping straight into the sugar. Because if you're having struggles, if you're stressed, if you're not coping well, then you're not going to be coping with your diabetes. And we need to talk about what's stressing you. And even if I can't help you, at least we can talk about it. So I think part of it is just bringing up the whole idea of we can talk about these things. Um, one thing we do try to do is look for ways to develop social support or peer support. So quite often I'm connecting patients together because I think this is someone who can provide some peer support. A lot of people have never met anybody who has type 1 diabetes or don't have any friends with type 1 diabetes. And that kind of social support can be really, very helpful. Um, we've also been trying to figure out ways to do it on more of a group level. And the idea is to have some kind of networking activities or networking function. And of course, COVID shut all that down for us. So we're still trying to figure out how to do some things like that. We don't have the greatest mental health resources in Columbus. We do have some for the LGBTQ community because Equitas came into Columbus a few years ago. And so Equitas has a huge kind of downtown and a lot of resources that, that we don't actually have at the university. Our students have a lot of resources for student health, amazingly. So that's something we do is talk to them a lot to try to help generate resources. One thing I do do with burnout, though, is my favorite book about burnout is still the one that Dr. Polonsky wrote about 20 years ago. 
And the title is something about, it's like diabetes burnout, what to do when you can't take it anymore. And so I encourage a lot of my patients to read that. And some of them have actually purchased the book and they come in for their next visit and they say, I've read it, I really appreciate it. I wanna give it to you so you can pass it on to someone else. And, and I think that that's a book that can be very helpful. But um, I think that these are the problems we struggle with all the time, every day. Um, and we don't have good enough resources yet. Just as an aside to that, the um, JDRF several years ago developed a psychology fellowship and they're funding a one-year fellowship for psychologists who have just finished their training who want to specialize in diabetes. With the idea is even if they're only training five or 10 people a year, over five to 10 years, that's a lot more people who can at least help the community of people with type one diabetes. And we've tried to get involved with that. We haven't been lucky in terms of getting someone placed to our site, but we're trying to do that so that we can actually get a psychologist into our clinic. Our long-term goal is to have one in our type one diabetes clinic who's available to patients, both has appointments and walk-ins. Um, someday it'll happen. Great, thank you for that information. Um, I'm also wondering if you could touch on how psychosocial elements play a role in diabetes management. For instance, how might issues with body image affect a patient who um, is trans? And uh, just an example, and how have, you, how have you advised patients in these kinds of situations? You know, in terms of body image, there's so much, there's so many things that people can worry about. And, and, and for me, one of the challenges what is it about their, their own personal self-image or body image that then becomes a barrier to their diabetes? Mm -hmm. Is it related to the shots? Is it related to bruising from your shots? Is it not wanting to wear devices because it doesn't fit in with your image? You're scared someone's gonna see it. Um, I have to respect that and I have to find a way to work around that. Um, but another thing, one thing that, that we struggle a lot with is people figure out very young that you can manipulate your insulin to get your sugar high to quickly drop some weight. And so then they're going to manipulate that when their sugar is way too high to keep their weight down, and that's not healthy. But, but how do you tell a young adult that that's not healthy, that that's dangerous in the long term? And that's a very fine line because one thing I've learned is the last thing that someone with type one diabetes who's struggling to find their place in life, they don't need to be told, if you don't take care of yourself, you're gonna go blind, you're gonna have kidney disease. To me, that's the worst thing I can do because it's not gonna scare you, it's just gonna shut off communication. And so, so I have to find a way to try to figure out how to keep the communication open and still figure out what the barriers are, so how I can support the person and help with their self-esteem and their self-confidence. Wonderful, thank you for touching on that. Um, so we know that so many people in this country don't have access to mental health experts, let alone healthcare providers, tools, treatments that they need to properly manage diabetes. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, the strain of access issues on the diabetes population and how that's actually compounded when you're also a member of the LGBTQ plus community. And also when you're a person of color, um, does anyone have any thoughts or, or issues or stories that they wanna share? Yeah, I'll talk about that uh, first. Um, uh, one, because it was, this is sort of like one of the reasons or, or the inspiration for me uh, starting Kyla Cares, um, because uh, black and brown kids are disproportionately disadvantaged when it comes to uh, management of, of this disease. Um, and the research shows that a lot of research has been done in this area and that children of color uh, fare far worse than kids of European descent. Um, and, and, and that also 
um, relates to like the onset of just the God awful side effects that could happen that could stem as a result of having elevated glucose for a prolonged period of time. Um, and multiple factors do contribute to this problem. Um, like the kids of color are, are in, infrequently use insulin pumps and continuous glucose monitors. They infrequently do self glucose testing. They have less contact with care providers. There's difficulty relating to care providers because of cultural and socioeconomic differences. Um, and also on top of all of that, BIPOC families are already dealing with like uh, just extreme social ills, like, like social stressors, like racism, which just adds like another layer of, of problematic situations to the equation. Um, and I know that, you know, all families, uh, regardless of like, you know, your, your background and where you come from, how much money you make, you know, all of our lives are shaped by the stress of managing this disease. But BIPOC kids, uh, they, they are just faced with far more barriers when attempting to seek care, especially as it relates to um, accessing the technology, which is available for, for treatment of type 1 diabetes. Great, thank you. Anybody else have anything on that? All right, I think we can move on to um, just how important it is uh, to find a community and find your community, whether it be the type one community or um, the LGBTQ plus community. Can you, can you speak to the strength of, of both of these two huge communities uh, and how they've helped you? Yeah, I can go, I can go first. Um, I think I got so much comfortable once I met other type one diabetics. And I think that was a life changer thing for me. And I can honestly say it might have saved my life because I finally found people who can relate to me. Um, I'm very lucky, lucky to have, you know, a type one diabetic friends. And I'm even more luckier, I have, you know, um, other gay men that are, have type one diabetic friends, uh, informations where I can call them, text them if I have questions. I, I think the community is like the root of this disease. I think it's, I think without the community and without everyone being involved and trying to help each other out, um, many, many people would not be in a good place. Um, I think a lot of people thank the community be, for where they are today in life. I know at least for myself, I give credit to many people who mentored me, many people who showed me that just because my life is this way today, it doesn't mean it's gonna be like that forever. Um, that's just my experience so far. Amazing, thank you. Yeah, I would say having a, a core, I've, I, I've been very blessed with having um, a very core group of LGBTQ friends. Um, on the other aspect with diabetes, I probably didn't start meeting, I have had a girlfriend growing up, luckily in my hometown that had diabetes as well, but um, probably until like the last couple of years, I didn't know any other gay diabetics. Um, and once I like, put it on my social media accounts, it started to become more active. And now I've got like a little slew of people that I can report to and I can check in on and they can check in on me and it's great. Um, I'm very grateful for them. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I didn't know many gay diabetics before probably this year either. So it's been, like, yeah. been very cool to find a community within a community. For sure. Right. Anybody else want to contribute to that? Okay. Um, I would love to know what advice you all would give to someone who's watching this about, um, 
you know, just really being comfortable and confident in their identity. Um, I would say like, explore that's the only way we, we all learn who we are you gotta explore and and figure things out it's it's a windy road and with a lot of highs and a lot of lows no pun intended like literally it's there's a lot of highs and lows to life especially during this pandemic so explore see what you like see what you don't like try it all don't try any of it, it it's all timing and Keep good people by your side. That's that's the, the big thing. Keep really strong people by your side at all times. Um, other than that, go for it. That's 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 what I would say. But yeah, I would agree. I would just say, don't be scared. Just be, you know. Um, just what we said earlier, just just live your truth and and find out what you like. Like JP said, find out what you don't like. Um, don't be worried about other people's opinions. I think that's a big one uh, that I finally learned at 20 years of my living on this earth, that I finally realized to not be afraid of other people's opinions. And there's always going to be people who don't like you. And unfortunately, sometimes you have zero control over that. And that's important to remember. Very important. Yeah, I, I agree with JP and Ray. Um, like, just explore and you know see what you connect with, and like most importantly, like surround yourself with people who uplift you and and people who also require that you uplift them as well. I love that, Simone. Did you want to add anything? I uh, just like to say same Z's <laughs> for all of <laughs> yeah. Definitely, like, yeah, just consider all the things in yourself, whether, you know, you can see it or like whether you've seen it or whether you, yeah, there's a reason they're coming up for you and like, get that person in you or that being in you all the space you deserve just to be without fearing, you know, what could come, because there's always something that could come, but like, if you're stifling yourself, then like, it just kind of gets in the way of, you know, the adventures, the good things, the things you want, you know. Love that. Does anyone have any final thoughts before we wrap up? Anything that we've missed, anything you want to add? No pressure. <laughs> no? I I would like to add that I we I don't I can't stress enough that being gay and uh, being part of this community and being part of the type one diabetic community both things could be really hard and um, if if we haven't already you know talked about it enough just keep moving forward if anyone has any doubts or any negative thoughts reach out to anyone in this community in this community in either community if you're also you know a part of the gay community and the type 1 diabetic community um i'm always open to talking to anyone about it i've already touched based on many struggles that i've had and i found a way to keep moving forward and i'm in a very good place today so final th my final thoughts is if you're someone that you feel you're in this deep hole reach out to anyone and this community everyone's very very well not everyone but everyone's you know very open to communicating with others and i i i, I love this community both communities and even if you're part of this community within the community i even love you even more <laughs> <laughs> Same, same, I have to say, but a lot of us are pretty great, so. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We hope you enjoyed the chat and learned from it. And we certainly hope to see you all soon. And I think I'm gonna pass it back to Jordan to close us out.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Alexi. And thank you all again for sharing your perspectives with us. We so appreciate your time, your energy, your vulnerability, and your advice. Um, just can't thank you enough for, for being so real with us and for giving us your time. And once again, want to thank the people that help make Community Table possible. Community Table is presented by the JDRF Beyond Type 1 Alliance and made possible with support from Abbott Diabetes Care, Dexcom, Lily Diabetes, Mankind, Medtronic, Omnipod, Roche Diabetes Care, and Tandem. We've got a lot more conversations coming at you uh, from the community table this year. So stay tuned um, and also stay tuned for some follow on content following this conversation. We're going to take some learnings from this, some learnings from this amazing group uh, and pass them along with, to you um, via some awesome content. So please be on the lookout. Uh, but until then, I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much again to everybody here. These panelists are just incredible. Thank you all. Have a good night. <laughs>